Okay, so let's read Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs and how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore I issued a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me that they may make known to me so that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in. And I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Dan- Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven dwell in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him gaze with the beasts on the grass of the earth let his heart be changed from that of a man let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Okay, so this is a very interesting chapter because... Um, in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar, this great and powerful king, is going to be cut down to size. God is going to bring him low. God is going to humble this man. Now, he suffered with something that all of us deal with from time to time, and that is pride. And we were saying last week that the very first sin of Satan... He was Lucifer. He was created an angel of God. But when he rebelled against God, he rebelled with pride. You read about that in Isaiah 14. He said, I want to be like the Most High God. I want to ascend my throne above the stars of God. I want to be worshipped in the place of God. And because of that, God cast him down. Kicked him out of heaven. And then, where does he appear the first time in the Bible? The Garden of Eden. So he appears there in Genesis chapter 3 and he starts to tempt Adam and Eve to rebel against God. And that's where all of our problems began. And from that moment till now, he tempts people with the same temptation that he fell from heaven by, and that is pride. He wants to get people proud. Nebuchadnezzar was a very powerful, very successful, very proud man. 
And God brought him low, as we're going to see here in this chapter. In chapter 2, we read about this dream that he had about a four-metal man. He was the head of gold. And then it was devalued from there. He had a chest of iron and arms of or chest of silver and, and arms of silver and then belly and thighs of bronze and then legs of iron. And so his kingdom, he was the head of gold, would be passed down to others, less less superior, more inferior to himself. But he was that head of gold. He was pri- he was prideful about being the head of gold there. And then in chapter three he made a gold statue of himself, 90 feet tall, that everybody had to bow down and worship. And that's what got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't do it. You see the pride in that? Here, you bow down and worship an image made of me. Yeah, made to look like me. And now here, there's this dream that he's had, this vision of a tree that ascends up to the heavens... And its fruit blesses the entire world. All the people eat of that and they rest in its shade. Speaking of his great and mighty kingdom, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest dictator of the ancient world. And he was proud of it. But God had to bring him down. He cut him down, as as it says here, to a stump for a time. Now why? why? Why is this in... Daniel, why is this in the Bible? Well, first of all, we need to keep this in mind. This book lays out the entire future of all the Gentile nations that will have dominion over Israel. What does that mean? It means from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until Jesus comes back in the second coming, which hasn't come yet, but will come, Gentiles rule over the nation of Israel. And this book tells about all those nations that will do that. Now, that's what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. Gentile dominion. This is what he said, Luke 21, 24. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Jerusalem is going to be under the the domination of Gentile nations. And they are to this day. The United Nations, they they always have to ask for permission to do these things by the United Nations. They're kind of under the hands of the Americans. For a while they were under the hand of the British. Before that they were under the hands of the Turks. And before that other nations, Gentile nations. But when Jesus comes back, He is going to establish His throne and He's going to rule as a Jewish leader on the throne of David over the entire world. And they will have dominion then. So Israel needed to know that God was still in control. This great leader, this Nebuchadnezzar, he was still a pawn in the hand of God. And he was going to bring him low. So God was in control over Nebuchadnezzar, over Babylon, over Medo-Persia, over Greece, over Rome, over the United States of America, over England. He's in control. God's in control over everything. And God's purposes will be accomplished on the earth. God is sovereign. And when we talk about the sovereignty of God, what we mean is that God does what He wants to do and no one can stop Him. It's been said, man proposes, but God disposes. God does what He wants. And the only limit that God has is what He self-imposes on Himself. So for instance... He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it's God's will that all people are saved, that no one perishes, but all come to repentance. That's God's desire. But God will not come into a person's life and override their will. Right? He respects every person's will, every person's choice. So even though He desires that people get saved... He will respect people's choice. So he limits his own sovereignty in in certain areas. He limits his own power in certain areas. He could just come in and make us do things, but he allows us choice. It says in Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart 
is in the hand of the Lord, and like rivers of water, He turns it wherever He wishes. So God can do with David Cameron and Barack Obama and with any other leader exactly what He wants to do. With Nebuchadnezzar as well. And so to see this great man chopped down to size is going to show Israel that God was still in control and would be, and this would be a great comfort to them when they were in their exile. What I mean by the exile is that in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came in, conquered Israel, and took them away to Babylon. They were in exile. So this is one of the reasons why this is in the Bible. The second reason is simply this. God loved Nebuchadnezzar. Think about this for a moment. God loves these dictators. God loves these powerful men, even though, even if they're really mean, even if they're really wicked, God still loves them and wants them to come to Him. God loved Nebuchadnezzar, God loves Barack Obama, God loves David Cameron. He loves people. And so when God works in Nebuchadnezzar's life to bring him low, it's an act of love in that guy's life. Whenever God works in our lives to humble us, it's because He loves us. When He intervenes in our lives with discipline, with trials, with difficulties that bring us low, it shows us that He loves us. Now, when you hear that, you might think, wait, that can't be. I mean, if God really loves us, then isn't He going to shower us with just blessing upon blessing upon blessing? I thought if God loves us, that means that all good things will happen to us. Not necessarily. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, in verse 3. It says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Hebrews 12.5 My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be rebuked when you are nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which we all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, We have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? (coughs) For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What he's saying is this. If we're truly sons and daughters of God, then God will discipline us. Not because He hates us, but because He loves us. And he says very clearly that the the discipline is not pleasant. It doesn't feel good at the time. Nevertheless, afterward, it does something beautiful in our lives. And so we, when when we're chastened, when... He disciplines us when He allows trials into our lives, hard times. He's not doing it to destroy our faith, but He's doing it to perfect our faith. He's not doing it to knock us down and out. He's doing it to bring us low so He can raise us up once again. He loves us and that's why. Do you know that the greatest judgment that God can lay out on any person is if He just lets them go their own way? lets them go in sin and never intervenes. This is what Paul said in in Romans chapter 1. He talks about how God gave people over to certain sins. He gave them up 
to homosexuality and then you know heterosexuality and bestiality and all these things he gave them over to these things it was a judgment upon their own lives and so the the worst judgment that god can give against a person is just to give them over saying i'm not going to intervene anymore so when we see god doing this to nebuchadnezzar and bringing him low because he loves him because he wants him to be his own son Look at verse 19 now. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. And so the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. So Daniel, called Belteshazzar, he was brought in to interpret this dream because he had the spirit of the holy God upon him. He could do this. And as he heard Nebuchadnezzar relate this dream to him, he just paused for a while and was very disturbed by it. And he said, Oh, I hope that this dream is about your enemies and not about you. Daniel cared about Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel cared about this Gentile pagan king who had taken him from Jerusalem, exiled him to Babylon, and then, you know, said some mean things to him, but eventually raised him up into his court. He became one of his counselors. But Daniel cared about his boss, who was an unbeliever. Question for us. Do we really care about those who are in authority over us who are unbelievers, whether it be a boss or a teacher, someone in the government, who's not a Christian, but who has authority over us. Do we really care the way Daniel cared? They were pagans, you know, and they, they did some mean things, but he really did care about this guy. Verse 20. The tree that you saw which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher a holy one coming down from heaven saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over you. Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be assured to you after you have come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Now, why did God do this? He says in 25 at the very end, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. He wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know something. That God is sovereign over you and over anyone else. That God is the top. And so he's going to send him out for seven times. Now that would mean seven periods, probably seven years, as we'll see. Seven years being driven out living like an animal, chopped down like a, like a stump, 
and not able to go back and you know, take up his duties as the king for seven whole years until he knew that God ruled. So you see that at the end of 25, you see that at the end of 26, it says, after you know that heaven rules, you also see that down at the end of verse 32, until you know that the Most High rules in the, kingdoms, the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he chooses. So God had a plan for this. He wanted to bring him low so that, that Nebuchadnezzar could realize that God was sovereign over him and over all nations. I want you to notice in verse 27, Daniel's boldness to this great and powerful king. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. He didn't, you know, just beat around the bush. He went right to it and he said, you need to repent of the way that you're living because perhaps God will have mercy on you and let you continue on the throne. Now that's real love. To be able to say to somebody, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what needs to change. You know, if, if I saw food on your face and some other people were snickering at you, you know, you've got food on your face but you don't even know it. Out of love, what I should do is go up to you and say, you know what, you've got a little bit of food on your face there. You need to just kind of knock that off. And you say, oh, thank you very much. And you clean it up and you look in the mirror and you're, you're all clean. That's love when you just shoot straight. But if I came to you and kind of went, well, you know, people in the world sometimes have food on their faces. <laughs> You'd say, what are you talking about, you know? <laughs> But being direct in a loving way is a very good thing. So when we see somebody that's caught in sin, the Bible tells us in Galatians 6, one, Brothers, if you see anyone who's overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So you, you do it, you do it gently, but you do it. You talk to them about it, because otherwise how are they going to know? And there will be other people who are snickering at the the obvious error in their lives, whether it be a food on their face or a sin in their lives. So tell them. Daniel told him. And Daniel was bold. This was a very powerful man. These guys would fly off the handle and they'd, they'd say, you know, into the fiery furnace or to the lions. They were just, they were crazy like that. But he was willing to say what needed to be said. Verse 28. All this came upon upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Okay, this sounds a lot like Satan in in Isaiah chapter 12. He had the eye disease that Satan had. I want to be like the Most High God. I will ascend my throne above the stars of the heaven. Nebuchadnezzar says, I've built this. It's all about me. Great Babylon. Now, Babylon was great. Listen to some of the things that, that Babylon had going for it. His palace had 172 rooms in it, five courtyards, and was covering 11 acres of land. The outer wall of Babylon was 11 miles long, 350 feet high, and 88 feet wide. You could They had chariot races on top of that wall, six chariots abreast. 350 feet high, 88 feet wide. The gates, there were eight main gates in the to the inner city, 100 gates on the city walls total. The Euphrates River ran right through it. 
There were 20 canals, 260 watchtowers, 24 streets. They had 53 temples, 180 open-air shrines for Ishtar. That's where we get the word Easter, by the way. uh, 1,800 niches, pedestals, or sacred places for other deities. Fifty. Uh, there was a solid gold image, uh, 52,000 pounds, to the god Marduk in in this city. There were the famous hanging walls or hanging gardens of of uh, Babylon, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Those hanging gardens were terraced gardens like a mountain 400 feet high. The city and, and the surrounding walls had 600 or, or 60 million bricks uh, in the city. Each one of those bricks was stamped with this inscription. I am Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of everything from sea to sea. You see the pride? And so he says, isn't this great Babylon that I have built? So he's up on this massive palace, walking around the parapet. He's looking over and he's just saying, look how great it is. Reminds me of a story of of a guy in East Texas, very wealthy oil man. He had a preacher that came over to his house and he brought him out to the back and he says, you see that 40 acres over there as far as you can see? It's all mine. You see the 40 acres over there as far as you can see? It's all mine. And he went around all four points of the compass and he said, it's all mine. I own it all. You see how much wealth I've got? The preacher just paused for a moment and he says, question for you, how much wealth have you got up there? <laughs> And he kind of said, oh, I don't have too much of that. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar was like. Look at all of this that I've built. But he was poor with heavenly treasure. And God had to bring him low. Where is that text from that you've just read? Of of all the facts? That's just from secular history. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you can make it. Yeah, just made it up. <laughs> you, you can just get on Google and, and search it. Yeah. Check out Babylon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is amazing. It is incredible. And so he's he's got this eye disease. Now, by the way, look in verse. 29. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. So it was 12 months later, after he had shared this with Daniel, and Daniel gave the interpretation. And apparently, based on what he's saying, he forgot about it. But God didn't forget. And so God had given him 12 months to repent, and he didn't repent. God didn't forget. So here, here's what's going to happen. Look in verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever He chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Okay. So, he was still speaking this word and suddenly God's voice I believe this is the Lord speaking a voice out of heaven maybe it was an angel but it sounds like it was God's voice and he says that's it you're you're going to be driven and immediately he was driven out and he basically was turned into a cow okay with feathers for hair and claws for nails now What's interesting about this is 
there is an actual condition known as boanthrop- boanthropy, which is the delusion that one is an ox. Now, in 1946, Dr. Raymond Harrison observed a modern case of boanthropy in a British mental institution, and this is what he said. The patient was in his early 20s, who reportedly had been hospitalized for about five years. His symptoms were well developed on admission, and diagnosis was immediate and conclusive. He was of average height and weight, with good physique, and was in excellent bodily health. His mental symptoms included pronounced antisocial tendencies, and because of this he spent the entire day from dawn to dusk outdoors in the grounds of the institution. His daily routine consisted of wandering around the magnificent lawns with which the otherwise dingy hospital situation was graced, and it was his custom to pluck up and eat handfuls of grass as he went along. In observation, on observation, he was seen to discriminate carefully between grass and weeds, and on inquiry from the attendant, the writer was told the diet of his patient consisted exclusively of grass from the hospital lawns. He never ate institutional food with the other inmates, and his only drink was water. The writer was able to examine him cursorily, and the only physical abnormality noted consisted of the lengthening of the hair and a coarse, thickened condition of the fingernails. Without institutional care, the patient would have manifested precisely the same physical conditions as those mentioned in Daniel 4, verse 33. It's really interesting, isn't it, that in a, you know, a modern context we see a condition like this in somebody. But this brought this man extremely low. Here this once proud man up on his throne and up on his palace and he's just driven out into the wilderness and becomes basically a cow. Now we're going to read about his restoration here in verse 34. At the end of the time, at the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Nebuchadnezzar was restored. He finally got it. Remember the Lord said, you're going to stay in this condition until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. Now I want you to notice the results of Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, what it brought about in his life. Number one was praise. Look in verse 34. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever and ever. And that's what the Lord will do in our lives too. When we're brought low, we understand how great He is and we praise Him. And so one of the results, one of the fruits of humility is praise. The second thing was perspective. Look in the end of verse 34. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? He understood who God really was, that he was sovereign over everything. And so he not only got praise, but he got a great perspective of God, that he ruled in the kingdoms of men. And then the last thing 
the last result of Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation was a proclamation. So praise, perspective, and now a proclamation in verse 36. At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now, at that point, he could have said, Great, I'm back to being the way I used to be. Everybody bow down to me. But he didn't do that. He said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice. And by the way, those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. He started to proclaim who God was to all these people that came back to him. It reminds me of what David said in Psalm 51. He said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, then I'll teach sinners your ways. He proclaimed his goodness when he was restored. And that's what God will do with us too. When we're restored, then we go and we restore others. Now, this incident, we often think, well, if, if it's really true, it's got to be recorded in secular history. You won't find any account of this in Babylonian history. Now, if you were a historian in Babylon, you probably wouldn't want to write this down because your neck would be on the, on the line, right? But this is interesting. There are no historical records at all of Nebuchadnezzar's government activity for seven years between 582 B.C. and 575 B.C. Interesting. Now that's odd because these ancient kings of the East recorded practically everything that they did because they were proud of their accomplishments. And you'll remember if you read... In um, some of the accounts, like in uh, the book of um, Esther, the king there, he couldn't sleep, and so he just had somebody reading the accounts of his kingdom to him. Like, oh, just show me the CCTV footage of my kingdom so I can get a good night's sleep. You know, how great I am. These guys kept meticulous records because they were proud of it. So, no records at all for seven years. But later on, and during the Greek time, there was a Greek historian named Abedinus who wrote in 268 BC that Nebuchadnezzar was, quote, possessed by some god and that he had immediately disappeared. And so there was this that had been passed down. So he wrote it down several years, many uh, centuries later, actually, 268 BC. So finally, kind of to wrap things up here. Look in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. This is what Daniel was saying to Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. God decreed it. God commanded it. God said it's going to happen. He was going to bring him low. The Bible tells us in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. (coughs) He says, at Jesus' name, who is the name above all names, every single knee of every person, past, present, and future, is going to bow down. (coughs) And so... That that includes the laws as well. Yes. (coughs) Because it says, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. (coughs) Now... The Bible also tells us this. In Proverbs 6.16, there are six things the Lord hates. Now, whenever you hear about something that the Lord hates, you want to say, okay, I want to know what this is so that I can avoid this thing that God hates. I don't want to do anything with this. Here are six things the Lord hates. And then it says, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. This is a Jewish way of looking at things. So seven things. Number one, a proud look. That's at the top of the list. Pride. The devil had it. He infected Nebuchadnezzar to have it. And from time to time, we all go through it, don't we? There's not a single one of us that doesn't have pride. 
And and so this is something the Lord hates. He wants us to be humble. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. So a divisive person, a one who kind of you know, breaks up churches and breaks up Christian people together and breaks them up. God doesn't like that. He, he hates it. The number one at the top of the list is a proud look. Now, when we read that in Philippians 2.10 where it says, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. We've got two options. Number one, we can bow down ourselves. Or number two, God will force us to bow down. Number one is the easy way. Number two is the hard way. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn his lesson the hard way. But he learned it. And God blessed him in the end. If we do it the easy way, it's so much better. Listen to what it says in James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. So, I know a lot of people who say, I'm praying that God would humble me. When actually, when God does the job, it, it can be really, really painful. And the Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of God. When you see who God is, just humble yourself before Him. And, and when you do that, then He'll lift you up. So, if we humble ourselves, it's far less painful. But if God humbles us, then it's far more painful, but the job will still get done. Now, if we resist in this lifetime, God will, because He loves us and because He's a good Father to us, He'll bring things into our lives that will humble us. Circumstances that He allows. A job loss. A financial problem. You name it. Something like that. It just comes out of the blue. We think, where did this come from? And God is working in our lives to bring us low so that He can exalt us in due time. Maybe it's a broken heart. A marriage that fails. A loved one who dies or a loved one who leaves. Something like that. That can bring us low. And maybe it's just a personal failure in our lives. But we're trying to do what's right. We're trying to make things happen and we're trying really hard and we just fail. Remember Peter. Uh, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you've been converted, go and strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, even if everybody else denies you, I won't deny you. I'm strong. I can do this. Jesus knew it. He knew it. And He allowed Peter to go through failure so that he could get in a place of usability with God. See, Peter was a natural leader. Peter was a strong personality. He was probably really big. You know, historically, that's what they say. He was a big, big, rough and tough fisherman. And guys would follow him. And he had a big mouth. (laughs) And he said, uh, if everybody denies you, I won't. God knew that he needed to be humbled and he allowed him to be humbled. And he got him to a point of usability so that on the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Spirit, who was it that stood up and preached and 3,000 people got saved? But Peter. And God wants to use every one of us. So he needs to get us to that place of actual usability. Now, when we think about these trials that come into our lives and different things, Let's just be careful that we don't start to judge one another and say, Aha! I know, you got sin in your life, and that's why God's humbling you. Because you know who we become like? We become just like Job's friends. We'll say friends in quotations. These guys, at first they were really good friends. They just sat around and wept with him. But then, after a while, they said, Ah! Must be a little secret sin in your life, Job. You know, why don't you fess up? And Job was saying, I I didn't do anything wrong. And he didn't. 
He was a righteous man, but God allowed this trial to come into his life for his own purposes. It was a mystery to him. And so we need to be careful that we don't do that. We just need to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So, just to sum it up, God's going to uh, have His way and He's going to exalt His name. He's sovereign. And we've got two choices, whether we humble ourselves or, or God humbles us. Let's choose the easier route. Let's just bow down when we see who He is. Why don't we just take a break now and, and uh, have some teas and coffees and then we'll get back together. Father, we just thank You for uh, this time in Your Word and we pray that You just bless our discussion in Jesus' name. Amen.